Hi, Steve. How's that? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so uh, I want to talk about uh, Node and microservices together. Uh, I guess um, part of the, the story of uh, Nearform, which is uh, the uh, Node consulting company myself and the Keynote audience set up a couple of years back, is a story of building ever bigger Node applications. Uh, you know, so we started off building really small things in Express and hooking them up to MongoDB and kind of that classic architecture. And then over time, uh, our clients got bigger and they needed bigger systems and they had to integrate into all sorts of crazy backend stuff or we had to rewrite huge big Java systems, that sort of thing. Uh, and it very quickly became a uh, question of how do you structure all this JavaScript code? Cool. Uh, so JavaScript, the language, um, has some great advantages in that it, it's really expressive and you can get all the stuff done in much less code than a traditional object oriented language. But it misses a lot of those code structuring features. The, the um, way that you create components uh, is relatively weak. And yes, node modules are a great component system. Absolutely love it. I believe the node module system is worth at least 50% of the value of the, the, the entire Node ecosystem. Um, but those modules are much more effective uh, as infrastructural pieces, um, utilities, and they're less useful as uh, encodings of business logic. And business logic actually is the stuff that we mostly have to build. Um, you know, so yes, you can use Passport.js or whatever, or Happy or something like that, and, and it has a plugin system and it gives you all your infrastructure layer. The problem is when we have to build the business logic and the business rules and all that sort of stuff and it's badly specified and the client changes their requirements and it has to be done on a short time scale and then when it goes live it still has to be changed. How do you manage the complexity of that business logic code over time? Um, so I'd like to start with um, a look at the way that people often build software in the enterprise. Uh, so this is the flight deck of the Space Shuttle Atlantis. This is a picture from STS-101, which is uh, one of the missions. Um, the software that runs this vehicle is some of the most perfect software ever written. Uh, it has something like one bug comes out every three months. Uh, well, obviously, when the software development was in, was in full phase. Um, one line of code costs, in aggregate, $1,000. And there's something like 400,000 lines of code. Um, the software is almost perfect. And I think the problem is that there's an implicit assumption by us as developers, and certainly by uh, the business, that when you build software, this is what you're aiming for, really. This is what software methodologies and testing and release processes and QA are supposed to give you. Because computers are always right. They always give you the right answer. You type 2 plus 2 to your calculator, and it always comes back as 4. Um, one of the most interesting questions that I ask a uh, potential prospect, a consulting client when they come to us is, what's the acceptable error rate in your business? And they kind of, they kind of look at me and go, what do you mean, we're not allowed to make mistakes? Um, but actually, you are, because this is engineering. It's a basic principle of engineering that you have tolerances. When you build a physical thing, you say the tolerances is a thousandth of an inch, two thousandths of an inch. You can't build physical things at perfect measurements. You can't build perfect software anyway. And I think a lot of the pathologies in software development arise from this implicit assumption, which is unsaid, unspoken, uh, but which, which we should challenge. So yes, this was a wonderful piece of software engineering, the software that ran the space shuttle, but it was enormously expensive. Uh, it only made sense in its context. Most software development can't afford to be this perfect. It has to move a lot faster. Uh, but there's another vehicle that we can look at that embodies a much more effective way of building software for the enterprise. Uh, so this thing is called the Gossamer Albatross. This was the first human-powered airplane to fly across the English Channel. Um, the backstory to this is uh, it was kind of an X Prize set up in 1959, 100,000 uh, pounds sterling for the first person to be able to fly across the English Channel under their own power. And 
For uh, about 20 years after the prize was announced, uh, people kept on trying to build aircraft, basically bicycles with wings. And they'd spend a year doing all this engineering work and design, and then they'd build it, and then the person would get in, and they'd fly for a couple hundred yards and collapse with exhaustion, or the airplane would fall to bits, and then they'd start again. Uh, but the engineer who eventually won the competition, a guy called Paul McCready, realized that the problem wasn't flying across the English Channel, the problem was how do you iterate on your design of that aircraft so that you can quickly test out ideas. And he came up with a component-based system of aluminium pipes and mylar wires that let him change the configuration of the plane. So he was building three or four different planes a day, and within a year, the other guys took 20 years and got nowhere. Within a year, he had flown across the channel and won the prize because he could iterate, because he had a, a good component model to put everything together. Um, the problem is enterprise software development doesn't, doesn't really enable you to do this the way that it's done in most places. Um, here's a metaphor for enterprise software development. Uh, does anybody understand why there's a yak? So this is a, a um, so you're building something in an enterprise system, and it turns out you need a new version of a uh, library. So you install the new version of the library, but it turns out that's not compatible with the current version of your language platform. So you have to install the version of your language platform, and that's not compatible with your operating system. So you have to upgrade your operating system, and that doesn't actually work on the current hardware. So you have to buy a new computer, and so on and so on. And eventually, you end up shaving a yak in the Himalayas to get the job done. And the reason is you have all these interdependencies in the system. Uh, one thing depends on another all the way up the chain. And a large enterprise system with, with a large code base um, has all these connections so that if you change one piece, you, you break something else. The database schema becomes very fragile. If you change a, a single piece, you have to account for that all across the board. Um, it's otherwise known as technical debt. Uh, it becomes very hard to move quickly. Uh, and again, the problem is, although you have a component model, and other languages, the object-oriented languages, have this component model, it's, it's a component model that is weak. It doesn't really give you the, the promise of components. You want your components to be things that you can easily plug together. This is what components are supposed to look like. They're, they're supposed to work like Lego. If I add another brick to the stack, I don't have to change any other bricks. They plug together easily. What's the essential characteristic that makes this a good component model? Um, and you can ask the same question of other component models that have, that have worked in practice. Uh, so Unix pipes, for example. Why do they work so well? Uh, and I believe in Hurricane that the, the, the answer is there is a consistent, extremely simple interface between components, a, a homogeneous interface. Um, if you look at the component model of object-oriented programming, or you look at the component model of even REST interfaces, they're too hairy. There's too many moving parts. There's too many different ways that you can interact with an object uh, or an API. You can't compose them together. The composability comes from the fact that if you have this extremely simple interface, you can plug them together like Lego bricks. Um, and if you take that idea forward, uh, you end up with a component model for building large software systems. Um, and that's where microservices come in. So because of the, uh, I guess, weakness of JavaScript as a language uh, to give you a component architecture, which the other object-oriented languages did have, dealing with complexity becomes something that you deal with at a different level in the system. Uh, so from our perspective, microservices uh, and Node fit together really well. Uh, and just, I guess, to clarify what that term means in the context of this talk, it's small independent processes. Like you can stop and start them separately. Um, they communicate via messages. They don't communicate by uh, one changes a database table and the other one reads the same database table. That's not allowed. You can only communicate using messages. Um, and they give you this powerful component model, which is part of what I'm going to explore in this talk. And the reason we use them 
is because they avoid this technical debt. They let you move faster. Um, you have this kind of cliche of, uh, you know, the, the Java.net system is going to take nine months to build and you do the same thing in Node in three months. Um, but in order to actually make that work at the scales that we're now seeing in the enterprise, um, you need a component model to make it work. Um, it's also really great for continuous delivery. So your unit of deployment is a microservice. Microservices uh, are great because they're units of development, they're units of uh, estimation, they're units of testing, they're units of deployment, uh, and they're homogenous units again, which is, gives you a lot of control over the development process. Um, and that gives you the ability to build really, really quickly, uh, because you can just focus on a single feature and one microservice implements that feature. This is engineering, it's not a free lunch. Uh, there are trade-offs. You have this complex deployment model. You can't do microservices without automation. And if you're not using Chef or Puppet or Ansible or Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or something, it's not going to work. You have to automate. Uh, the programming model is weird. Um, it's much more uh, event-based. Uh, it's a different style of thinking. And often what we see when people first move to this model is uh, they implicitly kind of make these uh, fallacies of network development where they treat uh, message interactions almost like function calls. Um, but you can't do that because the other side may not even be there, may not respond. Um, and the other tricky detail uh, is the services have to be able to find each other. So if I have a microservice A uh, that does something and it depends on microservice B that does something else, and I send a message between them, somehow A has to know where B is. Uh, but the interesting thing about this diagram is this could be a diagram of objects as well. That could be a method goal. Um, the key problem here is that there is a very tight coupling, whether that's a function call or a method call or a, a HTTP call over the network, there's still an extremely tight coupling. A and B have to go together. Um, and the, the essence of this coupling is A has to know the identity of B. The concept of B's identity is knowledge that A has to have. And that coupling is what makes, uh, ultimately is what creates tons and tons of technical debt. And it's also uh, one of the valid criticisms of uh, uh, microservice architectures, especially ones that are uh, HTTP based because you have all these HTTP calls to APIs, they have to know the network locations, which is the identity of the services. Ideally, you want to be in this world. This is a different world. This is a world where microservice A sends a message into the universe. And it doesn't know who's going to get the message, or what's going to happen, or will it be received by anybody at all. And B receives a message and doesn't know who sent the message, where it originated from, or anything like that. These are now fully decoupled. I can deploy new versions of B, I can deploy multiple versions of B, or new versions of A, into a live system. I can get continuous delivery. Um, I don't have to worry that I have the right versions, any of that sort of stuff. This is the world you want to get to. Of course, at the infrastructural level, physically, a still has to know where B is. Somehow it has to get this information. Um, typically, the, the solutions that we've seen, the solutions that we've used, uh, are things like, well, if you're using Docker containers, you could hard code the locations into a configuration file. Um, sounds a bit crazy, it kind of works. kind of works if you have not that many services. Um, you can have intelligent load balancing. So if you look at solutions like um, uh, Netflix's Hysterix, for example, or Eureka, where the load balancer is sort of an agent on each machine and it knows where things are. Uh, so each microservice on a given machine talks to an intelligent load balancer that does the routing for it. Um, the problem is the API endpoints are still identity. And with the configuration files, the IP addresses and ports are still identity. So A still knows where B is, or what B is. Um, you can have service registries, and 
But then it's the same thing, right? You ask the service registry, where is service B? And now you're identifying service B and A nurse to know that it's asking for service B. Um, you could use DNS. Right? That's a, actually quite common. Uh, and console, uh, the, the uh, service registry uh, solution from HashiCorp integrates with DNS and do all sorts of fancy stuff. We've built systems that use that approach. The problem is those names, those C names, they're still identity, they're still a concept of identity. Um, or you can use a message bus. Um, that's a slightly better solution um, because you're hiding services behind message queues and topics. But I'd still argue that the topic name is a weak form of identity. A still has to know the right topic to post messages to. So again, we go back to this question, how do we get to this world where A has absolutely no knowledge of B, and yet somehow the messages get from A to B? Um, and this goes back to thinking about things in a, uh, from the, the perspective of this uh, component model we want to get to. Um, there's a particular website called 507 Mechanical Movements, and it's based on a book published in 1868. And it's all of these um, sort of 19th century gear mechanisms and stuff like that. And I find it really inspiring because these are 507 components that you can kind of put together. And this is the essence of engineering. We learn something and we can reuse it again and again. We know that it's going to work. Um, and this idea of, of emphasizing the component aspects of large systems is essential to building them, to avoiding technical debt. Uh, but in order to solve this problem of identity, I think you have to step back and uh, apply uh, two different principles. And we've, I guess we've kind of discovered these principles over time, uh, sort of stolen them from other places. Uh, and they've helped us to kind of get to a place where we can demolish identity. Uh, these two principles are pattern matching and transport independence. So, pattern matching is heavily inspired by the way um, Erlang works, for example, or Lisp, where uh, if you want to respond or act on something, you look at the message, and if it matches a particular pattern that you're interested in, then you act on that message. Um, so you kind of have this fictional universe where every microservice sees every message and decides, is that a message for me, yes or no? Now, you know, in practical terms, that's never going to work. Um, but it's a nice mental model, because every single microservice can theoretically communicate with every single other microservice, and there isn't any, there isn't any concept of identity, because everybody knows about everybody else anyway. Um, it means that microservice B just says, well, I care about this pattern, and I'll just ignore everything else. Um, and A never has to know what that pattern is, it has to know nothing about B. So that's a nice mental model. Um, we'll get to implementation down the road. Um, and the other piece is transport independence. So, you know, there's a lot of debate about should microservices use message buses, or should they use point-to-point -point HTTP, or should they use some other mechanism, or whatever. Um, that is not actually a good question to ask, because it depends on the context. Um, how many of you have heard of CQRS, or are use it? at all. Uh, command, query, responsibility, separation. It's, it's a sort of a, a, a fancy design pattern for uh, managing complexity in large systems. And the basic principle is there's a write channel and there's a read channel and they're completely separate. So instead of having a single abstraction for reading and writing data, you just put them in completely different places. And the key abstraction there is that Writes are asynchronous and reads are synchronous. So when you want to change data, you emit an update message, uh, an update event, which gets captured in some way and processed in some way, and then modifies your, your system of record. Separately, you read the system of record directly, maybe through caches. So uh, you've completely separated the two things, uh, which means you know ultimately th that system is biased towards eventual consistency, but it does give you uh, a very nice model for building systems and scaling systems. If you have transport independence as a principle, then the read side of things could be direct HTTP requests, and the write side of things could be putting something on a message bus. 
and it gives you that flexibility. So instead of asking how should microservices communicate with each other, should be REST APIs or whatever, it's not a good question. It depends on the context. And from the perspective of a microservice, from a developer writing a microservice, there's simply one action, send. And however that sending happens, and whether you're actually publishing to multiple services or not, is not something that should be inherent in the microservice. Uh, so if you look at the, the pattern matching aspect, uh, this is kind of the way it would work. Uh, so let's say microservice B can deal with uh, heart the heart suite of cards. Um, so whenever microservice A emits, uh, in this case, the king of hearts, microservice B is going to pattern match that card and say, well, that's a heart card, so that's a card that I'm going to deal with. And this, is, this is pretty much it. There's nothing, there's nothing more complicated than that. Uh, the pattern matching algorithm that you use, again, is not particularly important. So long as it's simple and you can compose different microservices together, uh, it works. And you can get surprisingly far with this, and I'll show you a few um, design patterns using this approach uh, a bit later. Um, but what you get with this approach is uh, blind messages. So services have no knowledge of, of other services in the world. They don't know who's sending the services, and when they receive the messages, uh, they don't know who sent them. Um, but services do say, I'm interested in these patterns of messages, I'm interested in these types of messages. And that is metadata that you can capture and that you can use for message routing. Now maybe uh, you have a, a message routing system that translates topics on a message bus to patterns. Well, that's a perfectly valid architecture. Or maybe you have a service registry that uh, translates patterns to uh, network locations. Again, it's a perfectly valid architecture. So long as you're hiding that from the implementation, when a developer writes a microservice, they don't have to care how it's done. It's relegated to the underlying infrastructure. So you've abstracted away all that stuff. Um, so we'd often, we'd often help people who've built uh, initial microservice systems where inside the business logic of the microservice, dealing with the shopping cart or whatever, you see direct HTTP requests to other microservices. That is asking for trouble. That's like making a method call on an object. The same inherent set of, of dependency injections has to happen. Um, so if we've relegated the resolution of identity to an infrastructure layer, uh, the question still remains, how do you resolve identity? How do you find the microservice that is mapped to a pattern? Uh, so an interesting approach is to use a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. Um, so this means you distribute knowledge of identity globally. Um, each service maintains a local view of the universe. So let's say you have a thousand microservices. Well, each individual microservice has a lookup table of a, with a thousand entries, which might be IP and board numbers. Um, but that's only, I mean, it's only a thousand entries. Um, it's, it's actually a perfectly valid architecture if you think about it from a static sense. If you could hard code everything up together, um, it's always going to work. Um, each individual microservice has global knowledge. Um, of course, again, this is infrastructure stuff. When I, as a developer, send a message, I'm just saying send. I don't see any of this stuff. So this is a nice, uh, this is a nice world, but of course, practically, it's can't be done, uh, except it can be done, uh, because there's a relatively new algorithm uh, which actually does this, does this for you. Uh, it's called the Scalable Weekly Consistent Infection Cell Process Group Membership Protocol, uh, and there's a link to the um, academic paper. Uh, this algorithm is in production at Uber, uh, and Uber has actually taken this to two and a half thousand microservices. Um, Think about the problem you're trying to solve. Every microservice needs to know about every other microservice, which means that if a new microservice joins the network, somehow its location, its identity, has to propagate to a thousand other services. So do you broadcast over the network? And you can imagine how scalable that would be. Um, also, if a microservice dies, how do you let every other microservice know that it's dead? 
right? And the classic solution to that is heartbeat. You have a you have some sort of monitoring thing that's pinging all the microservices, and if they fail to respond within 30 seconds, they're marked as dead, and then somehow you either remove it from the registry or something like that. Um, the SWIM algorithm takes a very different approach, which has some really, really nice characteristics. So the orange service is part of the network. And it has, uh, it, it knows about all the other services. But instead of checking all the other services all the time, it selects a small random subset and it checks those to see are they still alive. And every other microservice is doing the same thing. Uh, now that has an interesting characteristic from a failure detection perspective because instead of waiting 30 seconds to see if something is dead from the perspective of a central monitoring point, what if 30 microservices or 30 nodes all determine that one individual is dead? Well, you have got a really high probability that it is dead right now. You don't have to wait 30 seconds. You can declare it dead pretty much straight away. And if you have a way of propagating that information quickly, you can detect failure and propagate it to the entire network within a couple hundred milliseconds. You don't have to wait 30 seconds to be sure. Um, so you get almost instantaneous uh, updates of the network state. The SWIM algorithm is, is quite clever because what it does is it uses those pings to propagate information. So when it pings a random subset, it also includes a small piece of data that says, by the way, these are the most recent changes to the network that I know about. So this information propagates very, very quickly. And it's called an infection uh, protocol because uh, a, a node infects its neighbors, you know, kind of like a zombie invasion. Uh, and the information propagates very quickly. So the design of the algorithm is kind of tweaked uh, in terms of the states that it goes through to give you uh, convergence times of a couple of hundred milliseconds. And convergence means globally consistent and correct information. Um, so the pink node is a new node joining the network. And all it has to know is the location of one other node. And it says, I'm here. And that node, the orange node, then attaches the information about the new microservice to its pings. And in the same way that death notices are propagated, birth notices are propagated in the same way, with the same speed. So you can add and remove microservices incredibly quickly to very, very large networks. Um, it's very powerful. Um, and the nice thing about it is it removes the dependence on uh, agents on servers that have knowledge, it removes the need for having a, a, another layer of intelligent load balancers, it removes the need to run a service registry, any of that sort of stuff, because the knowledge is embedded in the microservices themselves. Um, so the, your architecture, from this perspective, is each microservice includes a little library that implements the swim up. So A finds B over this cloud of services, um, because the SWIM implementation library is the infrastructure piece that has that information. I can't stress enough, from the perspective of the developer, all you do is send a message. You don't see any of this stuff. It's all in the library. Uh, this enables uh, a couple of really, really cool patterns. and enables you to build patterns really easily. Patterns that you'd have to implement using specific pieces of, of infrastructure. Um, so, for example, if I want to scale, uh, I want to scale uh, the work that goes into serving a heart request, I can just add more instances of the B microservice, and they're all listening for this heart pattern. Uh, and when a new instance of B joins, A knows about it via the swim algorithm. So I can get uh, round robin scaling just like that. I don't need to do anything. Um, my little library on the client side just is a for loop that just cycles through them, whatever the current list is. I can also get pub sub. So instead of just having a for loop, um, I just send a message to everything in that little array. And now I can add another microservice C that also listens to these messages. So if you're implementing, um, uh, let's say, a, a, I don't know, an auditing microservice that traces things through the system, it just piggybacks on the existing messages. Um, so I get pub sub, 
sort of for free as well. Um, and all it takes is a very small and simple change to that client library. So the client library is uh, an implementation of the Slim algorithm plus a few, uh, a few basic load balancing algorithms. Um, and it's really, really simple to implement. Um, you also get uh, two very important patterns from the context of building large enterprise systems. Um, so this one is uh, being able to add new microservices for new features, additive. So in this case, I have a B service that handles the generic case of heart uh, cards. But the ace of hearts is a special case which is dealt with in a different way. So I'm adding the C microservice that deals specifically with the ace of hearts. Um, in a real world scenario, you might have a HR system where you start off by building a user profile microservice and then as the iterations go by, you add a profile service for employees and then another one for contractors and another one for managers as new requirements emerge. Um, but you've been able to start, you've been able to do rapid development because all the users had a profile to begin with and you didn't need to design a global uh, uh, data structure or think about any of that sort of stuff or even do any domain modeling. As the requirements came in, you just wrote a new microservice. The details of the routing, right? how do you make sure that B doesn't also receive the ace of hearts, is an implementation detail. It's not, it's not relevant to the business logic of the microservice, because the whole idea is that C can say, I only care about the ace of hearts, that's it. Um, and the system, the underlying system, has to make sure that this works. But if you think about it, the ace of hearts is a piece of metadata. And when C joins the system, the SWIM network, it can say, I care about the ace of hearts. So the lookup table in A has send ace of hearts messages to C. Otherwise, if it's a, if it's a heart C, you send it to B. And that's pattern matching, incredibly simplistic, um, but it actually gets you very, very far. Um, and finally, you get to composability, which is where the, uh, the real power of a component model comes in. So, what I can do here is I can say, I can intercept messages for B. I can intercept these heart messages and I can manipulate them in some way. So, let's say I have a system with A and B and B is listening for heart messages. I add a new version of B that listens for heart prime messages. And initially there are none, so it doesn't do anything. And then I add microservice C, which listens for heart messages and modifies them into heart prime messages and sends them out. Now, my new version of B can operate on heart prime. And my old version of B is still there, so I'm split 50-50 between old B and C, and then I turn off old B, and now my system has migrated to this configuration, with no, with no downtime. Um, a real-world scenario, the B microservice might be a microservice exposing data in some way, and C might be a cache. So I added caching to my system without having to modify code, um, or with any of the other microservices knowing that there's caching going on. And I could do throttling or auditing or permissions or any of that sort of stuff just by intercepting the messages. That's the component model that's like later. That's, that's the thing that lets you start off really, really simple without having to know everything in advance. Because you can always intercept and translate messages on the fly. Uh, so, that's kind of the uh, all the theory. Um, there is code in Node.js uh, that kind of shows up all this stuff. Um, so I'm going to go through a, uh, an example system in 14 microservices. Uh, it's a little Twitter club, and it shows off uh, some of these patterns. Um, this Twitter club is uh, not a toy system. It's actually designed to be scalable to millions of users. Uh, the key piece of architecture is uh, it needs to have something called fan out. So uh, for Twitter to scale, uh, this is, there's a series of articles on highscalability.com uh, from a couple of years back where they talk about how Twitter scaled to that point in time. Uh, I don't know how they scale now, but certainly it covered where they got to in 2012. Um, basically, if you load your timeline, 
the Twitter system can't go and do a select query on some database to pull together all the different people that you're uh, following. Uh, that's, that's just not going to work. Uh, what they have to do is they have to pre-populate your timeline. So when you post a tweet, all of your followers receive a copy of that tweet and it goes into their timelines. Uh, and then when they load their timelines, they, they, they get the results straight away. So you need a fan out service that does that. So you can see that's a very event-based architecture. It's obvious that there's a couple of microservices there. Um, so this Twitter clone is designed to show off how you can use this uh, pattern matching and transfer independence piece to make all that work. Um, and obviously you need a library, uh, which is this thing called Seneca, which does that stuff. Um, okay, so the Twitter clone itself is really, really simple. Uh, it doesn't have a concept of user logins or authentication. To be a user, you just type in slash a name and you are that user. So here's a couple of screenshots just to run through the basic use cases. Um, if I'm user foo and I tweet, uh, start tweeting the names of movies, um, they start coming up in my timeline. Um, and if I look at uh, my own tweets, I can see I get a list of the ones that I have tweeted. Um, and if I'm user bar, I can go and search for some of the tweets from Foo, and if I click the follow button, then I'm following user Foo, and if I go and look at the timeline for bar, you can see that Foo's tweets are now appearing there. And if uh, bar goes and does a tweet, then it doesn't appear in the timeline for Foo because Foo isn't following bar, but if I go and look at bar, then I see all the tweets because I want to, I'm seeing everything that uh, Foo tweeted. So you have the, 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 the core use cases of Twitter. Uh, and you can see there's a couple of different pages there. There was a search page, and there was my timeline page, and there was a page showing my own tweets. Um, and in the microservice world, of course, you map each page to an individual microservice. Um, so we look at how to do that as well. Um, OK, so this system is very message-oriented. So here's an example message. Um, this is a, a search query. Um, you can see it's just a JSON document, um, and uh, what I've done is I've hard-coded a name-value pair search query, and any of these search messages always have that always have that uh, hard-coded attribute, and that's my that's my pattern. If I'm a, a search indexing microservice, I can say. I care about all the microservices that have search equal to query, and I'll act on those ones, and I'll ignore everything else. Uh, so that defines the, the, the pattern matching part of this approach. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, if you take that approach, you can then say, okay, well, look at the activities and the requirements of the system. Look, look at the things that happen in the system. They actually map to messages. Um, so I can actually say, Here's my list of requirements. And I can map those to a list of messages. Uh, so before I even ask the question, what services to build, because uh, that's actually a really hard question to answer, what services should I build, take a look at messages first. Go from requirements to things that happen to a list of messages. So in this system, you can see there's things like uh, I'm searching for tweets, or I'm, I'm inserting them into the search index, uh, or I'm posting a new uh, entry, um, or I'm listing the user's timeline, that sort of thing. Um, so I've defined a sort of a, a, a language, essentially, which is the things that happen in my system. And at this point, I can categorize the messages relatively easily into services. And I can start thinking about what would make sense. So I could have one big service, a monolith that implements all the messages, or I could break it down into services of different sizes. Um, there's this kind of thing where people say, well, you know, microservice should just be 100 lines of JavaScript, uh, which I have said myself on occasion, but um, it's actually, uh, with some experience, uh, it's more, it's better to take an approach of asking what's the right size for a given service. Um, and if you start with requirements and then think about messages, you have, a, you have a, a good mechanism for breaking these into groupings that make sense and then a service implements those groupings. Um, and that gives you a way to actually specify services uh, when it comes time to develop them. Uh, so for example, if I define the post service, which is the service which uh, 
when I post a tweet, operates on that message. I can say, well, inbound messages that it cares about are post entry. And outbound, it's going to say, um, save the entry in some database somewhere. Um, and it's also going to say, there was an entry. So this is, uh, this is an example of a pub sub architecture. Uh, when something happens in the system, you announce it to the world, and then the world can decide what to do with it. Uh, and of course, there's a search indexing microservice that listens for those info entry messages, captures them, and indexes them in a search index. But post and index have no knowledge of each other. Uh, it's just basically working on events and pattern matching the right events. These patterns are the metadata that gets propagated through the swim algorithm, and the client library maintains the mapping from these patterns to locations of services. Um, you can also look at it from the perspective of service interactions. You can say the search query message, between which microservices does it go? Uh, so it's consumed by, uh, it's sent from the, the search service displays the search page, the indexing service. And the indexing service is going to consume that message. Um, the info entry one is um, observed by both the indexing service and by this fan out service that has to inject it into the timeline. Um, so setting to the side slightly, if you think about interactions between microservices, you can categorize them. Uh, some of them are synchronous, some of them are asynchronous and some of them uh, are observed and some of them are consumed. So if it's pub sub, it's asynchronous and I just observe the messages. But if I'm storing data, then that's synchronous and I'm consuming the message because I don't want some other database to store the data. Uh, so this is a, kind of a way you can analyze these interactions. Um, so if we look at our little Twitter clone, uh, at the top level, uh, when a HTTP request comes in, I have a a uh, front service, which is just a, basically a, a happy, uh, it's just basically an instance of happy, uh, the, the uh, front end framework, and that sends out messages to four microservices that implement an API and three pages. So I have my home page and my search page and my own page and then this API. Um, so that means that if I want to change the search page, I change the search microservice without changing anything else in the system. Uh, and that's extremely powerful because that gives me continuous deployment. I don't need to worry about breaking anything else. Uh, and I can have multiple versions of the search page running at the same time. I can do A-B testing if I want to. Um, you don't need to worry about setting up a blue-green deployment infrastructure because you get it for free. Um, you just have to have your automation in place to control the microservice instances to make that work. Uh, and as, a, as an operational rule of thumb, we found that you should think about changes to a microservice system, a live system, in terms of starting and stopping an individual instance at a time. So there's only two operations you can perform on the live system. You can start a new microservice instance, or you can stop a microservice instance. That's it. So you don't get to say, oh, we're deploying a new feature, so spit up 10 instances of this microservice. You don't do that. You change one instance at a time, and that lets you measure the health of the system, make sure you're not breaking anything, and you get a, a, a serializable history of things that happen, which is really useful for debugging. Uh, so if we decompose the system a little bit more and look at what happens from those pages down to uh, business logic microservices, um, the home page uh, calls up the timeline the user's timeline, so it talks to the timeline service and says, give me a list of all the tweets. And you can see this is a synchronous message. Um, the search service is kind of the same pattern. It talks to the index microservice and says, I'm searching for this particular query, give me a list of all the tweets that match. Um, when I'm looking at my own tweets on my own page, um, I can just go directly to the microservice exposed in the database and say, give me a list of all the uh, tweets that are um, that you know about. You can see that the patterns don't have to be single name value pairs, they can be multiple. Um, the API um, lets you post a, post the tweet or you can follow a user. And it's pretty much the same structure. Um, but then it gets kind of interesting. 
So I can start applying some of these patterns. So for example, let's say I added a cache for the, the tweet entries. But you can see how I'm intersecting messages that were meant for the store from the host service. And that uh, caching service is now in front of the original store service. So that heart to heart prime thing is implemented here. Um, you can see how I'm posting info entry messages asynchronously and they're observed by both the index service and the fanout service. And the fanout service is also doing an insert into the timeline. And because you have the structure, uh, you know that it's going to you know that it's going to scale. Uh, so I'm going to show you that uh, this system. I'm going to show you some of the code of the system, just so you can get a feel for what it actually looks like from a, a code perspective. Okay, so. So I'm going to start from the top, which is the, the front service. Uh, so this is a service that takes in all the, it's kind of like a little proxy at the front, and takes in all the, the HTTP requests. Uh, and then sends them out to the service implementing the search page or the timeline page. Okay, so this one here is the timeline page. And normally if I was proxying HTTP requests to a, a, an internal HTTP server that was implementing a page, I'd have to say, this is the location of the upstream. I'd have to say, here's an IP address and a port. You know, like an Nginx configuration. But you can see, in this configuration, there is no data. There's no configuration data. Uh, I'm just using a happy plugin called WO, uh, WO that implements the swim algorithm, and it dynamically discovers the location of the, uh, the user or the timeline service. And if you look at the timeline service, So this particular service is just a simple, happy web server that's serving up uh, static HTML templates. By the way, this entire app uses old school uh, post and redirect. It has no client-side JavaScript, just to, you know, because otherwise I'd have to choose between React and Angular. And it's a difficult choice. Um, so you can see here that I have registered the fact that I can serve the slash user endpoint. And again, I haven't provided any configuration. I was speaking about uh, name value pairs of JSON documents as the patterns, but the patterns don't have to be, they don't have to be um, name value pairs. They can be URL endpoints as well. So in this case, when I'm serving HTML, the pattern is the, uh, the root, and that's the piece of metadata that I'm sharing. So this microservice, when it joins the system, sends out the metadata that it serves slash user, and then the front service picks that up. And I can run multiple instances of this service to scale, and it'll round robin between them. If I want to get my list of tweets, my timeline, I then have to actually send a JSON message, uh, which is what this piece of code does. So uh, I'm saying, send a timeline list into the universe, and the timeline service will respond with a list of entries, which I then just uh, put in my template and display. Um, the actual system um, also includes an example of uh, composition around the timeline. So this timeline service needs to scale to millions of users, and one of the ways that you can do that is 
sharding. You can shard the data. But I can also shard... Uh, so one of the things you do in microservices is you can store local data. So each microservice maintains a local database. So I can store the timelines locally. But in order to scale, I'm going to have to shard that data in some way. Um, but I can use this message infrastructure to do the sharding for me. I don't need to have any complicated sharding configuration. Um, so if I look at the if I look at the timeline service, uh, so what I'm showing you here is the. Uh, configuration of the timeline service, not its implementation. Uh, the implementation is, uh, uh, it just stores the, in this particular case, it just stores it in memory, uh, because we're not trying to be too fancy. Um, so you can see I have three files in the timeline service. One is timeline logic, which is the business logic. Um, oh, just for fun, I'll show it to you. And you can see it's just interacting with, it's using an active record pattern to interact with some sort of data store. Um, but the timeline service itself is the more interesting part, because this is where I'm saying, um, this pattern here, anything that has a timeline uh, name value pair, and uh, anything that has a, a shard value of whatever my shard was, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Those are the messages that I'm interested in. Um, so if I send a message that says um, timeline list shard 0, then the microservice that implements that shard is the one that's going to respond. And this is the, this is the microservice that implements shard uh, in 20 lines of code. Now, obviously, this is not production grade code or anything, and it is really simplistic, but it's showing you how it's really simple to um, just flip between two different shards. And I could use any different sharding algorithms here. In fact, this also solves reshard because if you um, add an extra property, then you can use the same trick that I used with the heart prime switchover to have a zero downtime transition to a new sharding structure. And uh, of course, running all this stuff requires a little bit of infrastructure, not just automation on the, uh, on the server side, but automation on your local machine as well. Uh, one of the things we use for that is a, a tool called Fuge, uh, which just runs all the microservices locally for you. Um, so I'll just give a little demo of the system. Uh, so this is the this is the GitHub repo. If you follow the link, and it's got the, the 14 microservices in it. In a production system, usually these would be all in their own repos because you want to have independent development and uh, you know continuous delivery and parallel development and all that sort of stuff. But, to understand the system, I just put it all in one GitHub repo. Um, so if I run the system with Fuge, it's going to start up everything. Um, and what that does is it starts up all these, starts up all the different microservices for me. Uh, so if I type in start all, it's kind of like a little process controller essentially. Um, and it'll spit out a bit of uh, logging updates as I add new things to the system. So once everything is up, I can go and play with the system. Uh, so here's the page for Foo, and I can add in, let's say, AAA as my uh, tweet. And you can see that I'm tracing the flow of messages in the logging. So you can see that uh, I'm only tracing some of them, not all the messages. Info entry gets posted out and then search insert occurs because the search service captures that info entry message. Um, so you can see how the system reacts and you can trace different things. You can trace the path of the message through the system. Uh, you can see that I'm only running one instance of the search service here. So if I go to uh, look for that message AA, you can see that 
It's, again, I'm, I'm tracking the, the search messages. And you can see that um, I have this uh, microservice called fc slash search. So search is a tag and I'm using two character identifiers because it's just a demo system. Um, but I can spin up another instance of the search service. So now you can see there's a you can see there's a two here. Now in the background, the Swim algorithm has propagated the existence of that search service to everybody else, which means I now get round robin load balancing. Uh, so I, if I perform the search again, you can now see it's. Uh, selecting on FC search, uh, but if I perform it a second time, you can now see there's a GB search has now appeared in the system. And if I stop, so if I completely stop the search service, so this is really cool for local development. Let's say I found a bug in the search service, I can just completely stop it, do some work, and spin it up again. And of course, the, the uh, it's broken because there's no search there. Uh, but if I, if I start search up again, and obviously because it's a microservice system, everything else still works. So now it's running again, and I can search, and now it works again. So if I wanted to make changes dynamically on the fly, I don't need to restart all 14 microservice, all microservices, I don't have to wait two or three minutes for my system to spin up, anything like that, I can just change individual uh, microservices. And this tool also has, it monitors to see if you make file changes and all that sort of stuff, you don't have to do it manually. Um, so what we found is this as a local development model is uh, really, really effective um, because it lets you focus on just the microservice that you're working on. Um, to the exclusion of all else, and your whole world kind of focuses in on just messages in and messages out, and just getting that piece working. Uh, and then you can take exactly the same code base into production, and you know, it, in this system here, looking at my machine, this is point-to-point -point HTTP, uh, but maybe in production you're using Kafka or something like that to transport the messages. Um, but your code doesn't change at all. The infrastructure layer of the library looks after the transport piece. And if you're using Kafka, say, it's translating the patterns now not into network locations, but into specially constructed topics. Um, so it preserves the abstraction. But you get the benefits of Kafka. OK, so uh, of course, there's this thing in the tail. I'm also writing a book on all this stuff, uh, which kind of goes into the um, the philosophy behind this approach and the, the different patterns and how you do data and the deployment and monitoring and all that sort of stuff, uh, which is on early release. Uh, so there's three chapters written. Um, so take a look, it's kind of fun. Um, it's slightly different from the, the other microservices books because it's a little bit slightly higher level, um, but it does kind of capture this philosophy. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Pizza, but if you want to take questions, we'll be bringing it in. Yeah, awesome. So that's yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Is there any questions? Sorry, Richard. Uh, these microservices. Uh, uh, we talk about the universe. Is the universe uh, the, the concept of the, the token application delivery as opposed to the internet universe? Oh yeah, it's the application space itself. So if you, imagine if you're running 100 services inside AWS. It's just it's those 100 services. Okay, so therefore uh, the concept of uh, integration and working with other services from other uh, yes. places is uh, good, good, good question. Um, those uh, external services, right, they might be legacy API endpoints, that sort of thing. Um, obviously they don't participate in this network. Uh, and there's two solutions to that. Either you can write an additional small microservice that fronts them, um, or use a traditional service registry like console that has that information. And then your microservices deal with them as a special case. Uh, 
which is a perfectly valid approach because there's not hundreds of them, there's only one or two. Are you uh, like data center aware? So whenever you have cross data centers, uh, can you have the optimization like the latency aware stuff or it's not a service yet? So this stuff we have only run within one data center. Um, I can't speak for Uber, but almost certainly they're running across multiple. Um, this, uh, this system doesn't solve the deployment automation side of things. Um, and there are a few gotchas. So for example, if you're using Docker containers, you have to use host network um, because the IP addresses have to work across the whole network. Um, so there's always, there's always trade-offs to make it work. Has the swim algorithm been implemented in Senec? So uh, it's implemented as a plugin. Uh, and that plugin uh, uses a library written by one of the Uber guys. So it's, it's pretty robust. Uh, so Seneca Mesh is the thing to look at. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's good for me. Uh, and pizza. Thank you very much. <laughs>